Hola amigos, que tal? It's Drew here from Spain Speaks with an update video today, a bit of a feedback video as we normally do every second day. Go through some of the comments, see what's happening there in the comment section. Lots of talk, lots of debate as usual. Not as many comments nowadays as there were a few months ago, but I must admit that a few months ago a lot of the comments weren't even worth reading, but now we're getting 150, 160 decent comments, which is what I think this channel should be all about. And not some of those comments that were put there a few months ago by people that didn't want to believe what was going on in the world, who attacked anybody that didn't want to believe their anti-virus propaganda. The virus doesn't exist, you're all sheep, get out and revolt, masks are useless. So many comments of that type over the journey, thankfully they're starting to disappear. In fact, on yesterday's video there was only one comment like this. I don't know why this particular person chooses to watch these videos because I've been fairly constant with my point of view for the last nine months, but I still see comments from people like this telling me that I need to wake up, that it's all a load of rubbish and we need to get out there and live our lives. Unfortunately, we can't live our lives at the moment. There are a lot of restrictions in place and every day until this health situation gets under control, things are not going to get back to normal in this country at least. We can see what's happening now in Australia because of a cluster, as they're calling it, in New South Wales in the northern beaches of Sydney. 28 people I read today have come down with the coronavirus, and that means that other states are going to start closing their borders again. I admit that this is a bad time for this to be happening down there in Australia. Everybody was expecting to have a normal Christmas down under this year, but these 28 cases in New South Wales means that a lot of people are not going to be able to have a normal Christmas anymore. Now I imagine that a lot of people in Australia have got no idea what we've gone through in a country like Spain this year or any other European country for that matter. The majority of Australia has been a fairly normal place throughout 2020 except for a couple of states. Of course we all know that Victoria went through a severe lockdown and there were various other restrictions around the country but nothing like what people have gone through in northern hemisphere countries. Here in Spain ever since we opened up from that severe lockdown, remember one of the severest lockdowns in Europe if not the world. It's been a constant on-again, off-again situation, like turning a tap constantly on and off with regard to restrictions, curfews, and what we can do and what we can't do. And it's not getting any better. Things that were said two weeks ago are changing today. For example, Madrid has come out today and said that Christmas gatherings are not going to be 10 people anymore, but six. Valencia has said that they're going to shut down the entire Valencian community and it's going to be residents only. And the Andalusian president came out yesterday and announced that bars and cafes are allowed to open now until 8 p.m. But from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m., they're only allowed to serve coffee and no alcohol. Somebody in the comments section asked me to try to explain why this is the case, and there's no explanation for it. The only reason I can think that they're doing this is because that they feel that alcohol leads to more serious problems. And that's the only thing that I can think of as to why they have that no alcohol ban from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. I suppose the best thing for these people to do would be to sit down and explain exactly why they have decided to do something like that and explain the logic behind their decision so that people are not confused. And the health minister, Mr. Iya, has been in the press a fair bit today. He's come out and said that Spain is going to start its vaccination plan now on the 27th of December. Of course, as we know, here in the European Union, the vaccine has been fast-tracked. Germany apparently pressured the European Union to get the vaccine approved before originally thought. And Spain, as I said, announcing that they're going to start rolling out the vaccination plan on the 27th of this month. The health minister also announced that there's no total lockdown on the cards, not now and in the near future, he said. A few people that I've spoken to in recent times have mentioned that they thought that Spain was heading towards another lockdown, but the minister has assured that this is not the case. They're going to keep their current strategy in place and allow the autonomous communities around Spain to control the health situation. And the most confusing thing for me at the moment is what's happening on the island of Tenerife. I said yesterday that Tenerife has decided to close down for the next two weeks, but the thing that I can't get my head around is that they're still allowing tourists to visit Tenerife. Is the island shut? Is it open? Who can go there? Who can't go there? Are local people there allowed to travel around or is it only tourists? These are some of the questions that I don't know the answers to. 
But anyway, another one of the mysteries of 2020. Now, I mentioned in yesterday's video that there's a bit of a fight going on at the moment between some members of the government, some of the more left-wing members of the government and some of the more right-wing members of the government about the minimum income and whether the minimum income here in Spain needs to be increased. The Podemos side of the government is looking to increase the minimum income, I think from 950 to around 1,000 euros a month, but don't quote me on those figures. And some members of the PSOE side of the government don't want an increase, saying that it's not the right time to do so. There's also been talk in recent times of implementing a four-day working week here in Spain as well. So increasing the minimum salary and reducing the amount of hours worked per week, you would think that we were living in prosperous times and not in one of the worst economic downturns in recent history. And don't get me wrong, I'm not against increasing the minimum salary. I just don't think it's the best time to be talking about it. And it's the same when it comes to a four-day working week. Is this the best moment for it? Shouldn't politicians be trying to fix some of the real problems that we have in Spain at the moment, like youth unemployment, as we mentioned yesterday, like general unemployment, trying to create jobs, trying to make the country more attractive for entrepreneurs so that they invest their money here and employ people? Shouldn't that be the objective of the government rather than these grandiose plans like a four-day working week? I don't know. What do you think? And I saw a few comments from people asking me about my Spanish learning experience, how I learned Spanish, how I managed to get my Spanish to the level it is today. Somebody suggested that I make a video on the topic, so I'll keep that in mind. But basically what happened is that I started learning Spanish many, many years ago when I was back in Australia. I started learning the language after coming to Spain for the first time and feeling completely useless because I couldn't communicate to anybody except in English. It was extremely frustrating to be in a situation where I couldn't communicate with people. And I think that it was in that moment that I caught the Spanish language bug. I went back to Australia and one of the first things I did was enroll myself in a Spanish course. It wasn't easy because one of the only places offering Spanish back then was an institution called TAFE. So I enrolled in that course. I think it was two days a week for about two hours per class. And the Spanish teacher's name was Carmen and she was from Barcelona. I attended those Spanish classes for about two years. I managed to get the basics of Spanish under my belt, the tenses, the past tense, the present tense, the future tense, probably got to a pre-intermediate level. And then I decided that I wanted to take my Spanish to the next level. So I applied to learn Spanish at university. I went to do an interview with the Spanish professor. His name was Francisco Martinez. He asked me some fairly simple questions in the present, the past, and the future. I managed to get through that interview okay. And he said that he would accept me into his Spanish course at university. And that's when my Spanish began to take off because I was suddenly immersed in the Spanish language. I was living in Perth, but I was immersed in that course because there was only a small amount of students that were studying the same course, and six out of the 10 were from Spanish-speaking countries. I think there were two ladies from Argentina. There were two people from El Salvador, Alberto. He became a very good friend of mine. There was another guy from Spain, Jose, and I think there was a lady from Chile, but I can't remember what her name was. And basically what happened is that I was thrown into the deep end because for the first year I couldn't understand a word that was said in the class. I had no idea how to write in Spanish, and my conversation skills were limited to a yed fui al cine. But I managed to get through the first year. I think I only just passed, and then that summer in Australia, I think December, I decided to come to Spain and spend the Christmas period here. I think I was here for about five or six weeks. And during that time, I began to pick up more and more Spanish. I started to read Spanish newspapers, watch Spanish TV, and I was able to have basic conversations with people, but my confidence grew. Back to Australia again, I went another year at university, but I started to look around Perth for people that spoke Spanish, people that came from Spanish speaking backgrounds. I found a few people from Spain. I found a few people from South America, and I started to mingle with these people in order to improve my Spanish. Not easy because, of course, when you don't speak the language very well, people don't really want to speak to you. Another year at university, my Spanish continued to improve. And at the end of that year, I decided not to come to Spain, but go to another Spanish-speaking country. So I packed my backpack and headed to Argentina for a month. And it was after that trip that I really started to feel comfortable speaking Spanish. And my third year of university, my final year, my Spanish really started to take off. And I think I even finished the year with a few distinctions or high distinctions in Spanish. So that was it. I graduated, said goodbye to the family, packed my bags and came to Spain. And because of all of that hard work that I'd done beforehand, I was able to hit the ground running here in Spain. So there you go. That was my language journey, my learning experience with the Spanish language. And as you can 
can see persistence is the name of the game. On that note, I'll start to wrap the video up. Questions and comments, please leave them in the section below. Debate the situation out as you normally do. Give the video a thumbs up if you liked it, thumbs down if you didn't. I'll see you in the next one. Hasta luego.